is the former director and the current president, Professor Robert Fowler. He is Emeritus Professor of Greek, former Dean of the Faculty, and Fellow of the British Academy. Bob's scholarship on Greek historiography and mythography has defined the field. His edition of the early Greek mythographers in 2013 earned him the Charles J. Goodwin Award of Merit for a significant contribution to classical scholarship, and a British Academy Medal for transforming understanding. These are achievements worthy of an endowed ode. He has, in the last few years, returned to his old love, <coughs> Greek lyric, and especially to its reception in the critical traditions of Western Europe. Tonight, he will share with us some of that research. Friends, a warm welcome, please, for Professor Robert Fowler. Pope 
and Johnson. And this work too, his art of poetry, was pilloried in Pimpo's uh, com comparison. So, voila, we thought it. Since the beauties of this poet are closely bound up with his language, the author of these dialogues, who apparently knows no Greek and has read Pindar only in quite defective Latin translations, took to be gibberish that which the feebleness of his own race did not allow him to understand. He has particularly ridiculed those marvelous passages where the poet, to mark a sphere entirely outside of itself, breaks by design the train of his discourse and takes leave of reason, if one must so express the matter the better to enter into it, very carefully avoiding that mythological order and those precise connections of sense which deprive lyric poetry of its soul. The critic of whom I speak has not noticed that in attacking Pindar's noble audacity, he was giving cause to believe that he has never understood the sublime in the Psalms of David, where if one may speak of those sacred songs alongside such profane matters, there are many of these interrupted trains of thought, which sometimes even serve to make one sensible of the divinity. To all appearances, this critic is little persuaded of the precept I advanced in my art of poetry concerning the lyric ode. Its impetuous style of random mock proceeds through large affair disorder, thus achieves. Indeed, this precept, which gives us a rule that sometimes one should not observe rules at all, is a mystery of art, which a man without taste, who thinks that K.D. and our operas are the model of the sublime genre, who finds Terence Bland, Virgil frigid, and Homer nonsensical, and whom a kind of deformity of spirit renders insensible to all that ordinarily astonishes people, cannot easily be made to understand. Now, in the first edition, after uh, deformity of spirit, he went on to say, which they say he shares with his entire family. Now, Pepo took particular offense at that remark, and so it was eliminated from subsequent editions. And apparently, they made up a quarrel afterwards. The, the rest of this is standard invective, and uh, they uh, made up their differences and, and said quite, quite nice things about each other. Now, what was uh, fair disorder, beau disorder, uh, must be thought an elusive concept if you need taste to understand it, and whose taste, after all. But it is symptomatic of contemporary concerns about emotion versus reason, the place of inspiration in poetry, and sources of authority. And such matters could have serious political implications, and this was no mere literary spat. In the following century, the challenge to monarchy and the church reached the violent climax in the French Revolution. The idea that an individual genius or art could provide better access to truth than received authority was obviously very dangerous. And Pindar could be a proxy battleground for issues like that. So conservative critics like Poirot wanted to put a break on enthusiasm, while others wanted to give free reign to it. Pinder's apparently unregulated rhythms gave the license for wildly undisciplined translations and imitations. This view of Pindar's meter was reinforced by Horace's description of his verses as being like a river in spate. And overwhelming force like that was indeed associated with sublimity in Longinus and other ancient texts. In fact, Pinder's verses follow quite rigid schemata, but these were not well understood at the time. And the result was a lot of bad poetry passing under the name of Pindaric Odes. Samuel Johnson, who like Waddle thought that even enthusiasm must have its rules, took a dim view of such stuff. This lax and lawless versification so much concealed the deficiencies of the fair and flattered the laziness of the idle that it immediately overspread our books of poetry. All the boys and girls caught the pleasing fashion, and they who could do nothing else could write like Pindar. Pindar's stock rose and fell in accordance with one's understanding of these issues and of his practice. His star shone as brightly as the 19th century progressed, although romantic poetry's obsession with the sublime remained undiminished. 
In the early 20th century, uh, Bindar's fortunes revived with the publication of uh, Friedrich Hörgelin's translations and his own previously unknown poems, which were written in the last years uh, before he went mad in 1806. Hörgelin's engagement with Pindar was intense, personal, and fine-grained, that of one great poet with another. His adoption of Pindar's characteristic uh, parataxis, uh, his run-on style, as it's called, with, uh, with minimum amount of uh, dramatic or syntactical subordination, uh, invaded that. He, uh, also, Pindar's stark juxtapositions, his uh, grammatical ambiguities, his way with metaphor and myth, and I think above all, his own union of poetic and spiritual vision had a profound impact on contemporary poetry, and through him gave a temporary boost to Pindar's reputation. Uh, but in much of the 20th century, lack of sympathy for Pindar's aristocratic politics and his business of praising great men sometimes proved to be obstacles to appreciation. And in the wake of lethal challenges to traditional metaphysics, uh, the idea of the sublime also underwent radical reinterpretation. But there are nonetheless many points of continuity in these conversations about Pinder and the sublime over time. And what I've been doing in my current project, of which this lecture is a taster, is to pick up some of the points that seem particularly interesting and promising, and ask whether they might lead us to a reappraisal of Pindar's poetry. Of the many signs under which one could read Pindar anew, the sublime seemed the most promising, not least because it is encouraged by Pindar himself. In the four books of poetry by which we principally know him today, Ebonition Poetry, poems celebrating victories in the great and the Olympic Games at Olympia, Delphi, and elsewhere. He speaks of the victor's nobility and their superiority, their everlasting fame. He has a lavish stock of words for excellence, heights, peaks, boundlessness, enormity, and praise itself. He compares his victors to the great heroes of Greek men, Achilles, Perseus, and all the rest, children of the very gods. And in the moment of victory, these winners are indeed touched by divinity and reflect its splendor. Now, if the praised poet is to do justice to such sublime subjects, his performance must be no less exhilarating. Pinter leaves us in no doubt that he is equal to the task. Few ancient poets speak so insistently about their craft, and here too we find ample encouragement to think of sublimity. There are images of flight, and speed, and brilliance everywhere. According to Pindar, his poems have wings. They are arrows. They are far-sailing ships. They are whirling javelins, speeding chariots, flowing waters. The poet calls himself an archer, a javelinier, a charioteer. He soars as the eagle in the clouds above the raucous ravens and jackdaws far below. The note resounding throughout the admonitions is a thunderous diapason extolling victors, heroes, and gods. Nothing here is pedestrian, ordinary, or earthbound. It's time to look at some verse. The first Pethian honors Hiram, ruler of the Syracuse, who had won in the chariot race at Delphi in 470 BCE. The poem was first performed in the city of Etna, which Hiram had newly founded at the foot of the volcano of that name, or rather refounded after evicting previous inhabitants. The poem has been called sublime by critics of all ages, and here is the old. Golden Lyre, rightful possession of Apollo and the violent tressed muses. The dancers' steps heed you to start the celebration, and singers follow your cue when your quivering strings set up the choral preludes. You extinguish even the piercing lightning bolt of ever-flowing fire. On Zeus's scepter, the eagle sleeps, Swift wings drooping on either side, king of birds. You poured upon his curved head a murky cloud with a sweet key to lock the eyelids. Slumbering in the grip of your casts, he gently heaves his listen back. Even mighty Ares leaves his cruelly barbed spears outside and warms his heart with sleep. 
your guides enchant the minds even of the gods through the art of Plato's son and to be quote muses. But those who are not of the Zeus and are stricken with terror to hear the cry of Pierides, the muses, by land and unyielding sea, and he who lies in dread Tartarus, enemy of the gods, Tychos of the hundred heads. A famous son of King Cave once reared him, but now the cliffs above Cumae fencing the sea and Sicily crash, <laughs> crush his shaggy breast. A towering pillar pins him snowy uh, year round in their of bitter snow. From its depths, purest flows of unapproachable fire belch forth. By day, its rivers pour out a shining stream of smoke, but in the darkness, a rolling red flame brings the boulders of the crash to the deep flat of the sea. That creature sends up most terrifying founts of the vices, a wondrous prodigy to behold, a wonder even to hear of from those who were there. Now, theorists of the sublime from antiquity to the present, while having very different perspectives, have tended to work with a similar list of qualities, such things as grandeur, exhilaration, wonder, shock, fear, uh, ineffability, inability to describe what's happening, to connect with the apparent uh, source of the sublime, and obscurity. Our passage illustrates many of these points. There is geographical, even cosmic, vastness in the canvas, from Cilicia in the east to Sicily in the west, practically the outer limits of the Greek world. From Typhus's prison in Tartarus to the heights of heaven, and in the third dimension, Typhus's monstrous body stretching from Sicily in the south to the Bay of Naples in the north. The description of the eruption of Etna was famous in antiquity. It is echoed by the author of Prometheus Bound, by Lucretius, Ovid, and Virgil, and it comes readily to Longinus' mind as an example of the sublime in nature. The keynotes of wonder and fear are sounded emphatically at the end. Longinus' most important requirement for sublimity in literature, uh, grandeur of conception, first requirement in his list, is satisfied several times over here by the image of the heavenly concert, the image of the prostrate giant, and less obviously, but just as importantly, by the juxtaposition of these two tableau. That kind of clash is key to some classic understandings of the sublime. Two quite different kinds of emotion jostling for attention in the same space. Joy and exultation on the one hand, anxiety and fear on the other. Now, in his enormously uh, influential treatment of 1790, Emmanuel Kant explores our inner conflicted experience as the true source of the sublime rather than the qualities of the external phenomenon. For Kant, the experience is one of simultaneous repulsion and attraction, an oscillation of positive and negative feelings. His chief examples are drawn from nature. So the enormous power of the volcano, this is Etna, and there is Pindus River of Fire, River of Fire at night. This power engenders fear in us, but it also brings a delight when we realize that we are safe and can contemplate this at a distance and be the pleasure of being able to uh, understand it or to try to understand it uh, is a kind of affirmation of our essential nature and Kant's view as rational beings, something that no being, not even God, can take away from us. Another stock example is uh, Oh, sorry, I've gone wrong again. Waterfalls. This is Niagara. It's a stunning spectacle, magnificent, beautiful, but also very scary. It, you can stand right there where this video was shot. Stop. Just off the edge there. The uh, the promenade and the uh, railing is just a few meters from the edge of the cataract. 
So you go up there and you're mesmerized by it. You feel yourself starting to lean over that barrier, right? And you look into the waters and you think, well, how deep is it there? How much water is going over the edge? The answer is 160,000 cubic meters a minute, but I mean, the number means nothing, right? So you're trying to send somewhere or other sense to feel the, the enormous power. What would it be like to actually be in that water? Could you, by some miracle, actually resist and swim upstream? Or what would it be like to be swept over the edge? So you're leaning over closer and closer, then you suddenly draw back with relief, and then you start leaning over again. So it's, Simultaneously, uh, an experience of repulsion and attraction. So, uh, the sublime on a Kantian reading is a kind of unstable combination of beauty and terror to simplify it to its absolute essentials. I think that one can see at least two important ways in which this kind of oscillation uh, might be relevant to Pindar's poetry. The first is that for Pender, this moment of triumph he celebrates is always hedged around by the threat of disaster. For him, the games were a metaphor of life generally. With enormous effort and divine assistance, human beings can achieve great things. But our glory is evanescent, our happiness precarious. Just occasionally, everything comes together in one magical moment what Pindar calls the kairos. The forces of destruction and misery are sadly uh, far stronger, a lesson that Pindar has inherited from the Iliad. What Pindar quite miraculous, miraculously achieves in his poetry is a recreation of that original kairos of the victory, not by pretending that misfortune does not exist, but by finding the right perspective for it and evoking it just the right extent. Joy predominates, but against the background of opposition, envy, both human and divine, fear, and above all, uncertainty. And the poems vividly enact this restlessness, this oscillation. They become events in themselves, which recur on each performance or reading. And their sublimity lies in their power to make us hold on to that exhilaration, not the fear despite being so very near to the river's edge. Hostile forces, particularly divine enemy, um, crowding in on all sides. He manages to still the unstable oscillation to hold it in equilibrium somehow for one brief moment. Now, as in the Iliad, his view of human life is a grimly pessimistic one. But consider that without the negative, positive cannot exist. Pinder depicts celebration on Olympus in the first Pythian Ode, as we've just seen. Elsewhere, he refers to celebration on the Isles of the Blessed and in the land of the Hyperboreans, similar uh, figures in symbolic, or places in symbolic terms. Now, whatever is sung in those blissful places, it cannot be Evanesian poetry, for where there are no defeats, there can be no victories. So in our poem, the positive comes first, and it opens with a celebration of the power of music. The point is much more than the communal pleasure that people feel at a concert. In Greek culture, music had powerful ethical associations. Different tunings of the lyre, harmonia, were thought physically to embody the ethical qualities associated with different kinds of music. The lyre, moreover, was felt to induce a sense of calm serenity. Longinus says that by the consonants, the symphonia, symphony of its sounds, the lyre exerts a wonderful enchantment upon its audience. The language he uses suggests a physical intervention of the sound in the listener's constitution. If you look at this passage, you see that Pinder also has a kind of physical conception of, of sound, that the sound grabs the, the eagle and, and shakes its back. Uh, and he also speaks in terms of enchantment. So uh, he uses here the word enchant, and the word for that is stalge. Uh, now, 
uh, it's the darts of the music which are piercing the people that are listening. And the word for darts is uh, kela. Uh, but that is a pun because the verb kelein is a synonym of the verb dalgain. So the point is totally reinforced. So the poetry had this power of enchantment, this deeply embedded notion in, in Greece. Well, throughout the first pentagon, of which you saw the first uh, triad, uh, there is a strong emphasis on civic concord. Public order, respect for fellow citizens, devotion to the common good. So the harmonia, the harmony of the music reflects the civic harmony. As the poet plucks his lyre, he enacts a quite tangible metaphor. The music and dance in themselves would have helped create a feeling of bonding in the audience, whatever theme the poet had chosen. But his deployment of the music itself, both as a theme and to reflect the actual proceedings, because the liar that he's plucking would have done just exactly what he says, set the, mark, the, the dance going um, in the lines. So all of that sort of doubles and reinforces the effect, which surely created in any well disposed recipient the mood of enchantment identified by Longinus. Then we get the oscillation. A few years before the first Pythian was performed, the volcano, which loomed over the city, had spectacularly erupted. One can imagine the spectators looking nervously over their shoulder at the, 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 the dangerous mountain as the lines describing Typhos underneath were recited, and uh, this very recent experience would still be fresh in their minds, and they could probably see the mountain from where the, the ode was being performed. So this monster pinned underneath, and here he is in a very well-known depiction from uh, the 6th century BC. Uh, as many monsters are in Greek art, depicted with a sort of sneaky body and, and wings, um, anthropoid upper hand. So the monster pinned me, uh, and I think we should accept that we have no reason to doubt um, his real existence in the minds of the contemporaries, might easily escape and have to be defeated by Zeus all over again. In Greek mythology, Typhos was the last great opponent of Zeus before he finally established his dominion, a fearsome adversary. Had Typhos won, chaos and lawlessness would prevail instead of the justice and good order of Zeus. Human polities are, of course, much less stable. But the idea is that the good order on earth is meant to reflect and be guaranteed by the good order of heaven. Kings uh, from whom or on owe their authority to the great king of heaven, Zeus. But in reality, Ordinary politics are less secure than the rule of Zeus. And Hiram was indeed beset by enemies, both externally and internally. Now, the external ones, at least, had been defeated for now. Uh, the mythological victory parallels that of Hiram over the Etruscans in 474 and of his brother Galon over the Carthaginians in 480. That time was supposed to be on the same day as the Battle of Salamis. So these uh, barbarous enemies, like Typhos or the Persians at Salamis, threatened to destroy the Greek order. They represent violence, hubris, and slavery. These associations uh, are quite explicit in the poem. <coughs> Internal enemies are not so easily dealt with. Though Hiram was still in power when he died, his dynasty was overthrown less than a year later. Even if we did not know the history, though, I think it's not difficult to guess that the poem's earnest and repeated pleas for good order in the city had a subtext. So the background threat is there, and our titles could break out at any time. But the abiding impression of the poem, taken as a whole, is positive. At the outset, the celebrations on Earth receive a sublime uplift by the suggestion that they are mirrored in heaven. There, the scene is more intimate, like a Greek symposium, an indoor gathering of friends.
lives. But the, uh, this companionable atmosphere may be read back onto the scene below. The way we suddenly realize that we are on Mars, and uncertainty about when exactly in the first five lines the poem shifted its perspective, illustrates my second kind of oscillation, which is that which characterizes the relationship between humans and gods. But first let me say that it's typical of scholars to expend their energy arguing about when that transition occurs. And thus, they miss a big point. Some say, in fact, we're already there in heaven on line one. Others say we don't get there until line five on Zeus's scepter, etc. It's clearly uh, unambiguous. A related argument is whether the first performance of this poem was, in fact, at a symposium or at an outdoor public celebration. Unsurprisingly, scholars cannot agree about that either. There is no resolution to this because the poem refuses to commit. Suppose it was a symposium. The language of choral performance is there and brings all the associations of that institution into play for the symposiasts. Suppose it was a public choral performance. It is painted in the colors of the symposium, suggesting that the court of Hyron is a cozy and amicable place, where the door is always open to cultivated persons uh, and foreign guests like Pindar. The relation of Pindar's poems to the occasions on which they were performed is always oblique. They are never simply scripts or passive echoes of the external proceedings. They are instead idealized transfigurations of those occasions. They lift them into a different order of reality. Because of that shift in perspective, Pinter is able to write for all the audiences, whether those at the premiere or those coming later. He's very keenly aware of both those groups. Indeed, they're on equal footing in the poems. For the secondary audience, his stance means that however they imagine the scene, they can be there. We can be there. We can all have an imagination of what it was like to be there. Uh, and we can share in that feeling of, of uh, exhilaration, that feeling of, of uh, communality engendered by the music. To me, that is part of Pindar's sublimity, that he creates this desire to imagine what it was like to be there. And like any uh, erotic relationship, it's what it is, I think, as Plato teaches, if one could actually possess the object of one's desire, one would cease to be in love. So the sublime must remain absolutely unattainable. So this desire to be there, not the nature of the there, uh, is the point that scholars miss. But their decades-long debate about the nature of the, the there, the first occasion, uh, actually attests to the existence of that desire that really, really want to know what it's like because they think that's going to be the key to understanding the poetry. And in fact, it's not. Of course, we need to ask about the nature of the first occasion in order to be able to think about the relation of Pinterest holds to it. But it's not the kind of relationship the scholars have uh, traditionally thought it is. And of course, really being there would have felt different. But it's only one way to experience the poem and not necessarily the definitive way. We have the luxury that the original audience did not have of contemplating the whole poem at leisure as a literary experience. So our relationship with that sublimity is an effort to reach back across time. For the first audience, the affective relationship with the sublime works the other way around, coming forward with the future they could never experience but which they could imagine through the poet's vision of eternal fame. Critics in recent years uh, have begun, I think, to appreciate this aspect of Pinter's that they can see that, in fact, he is literature and not some sort of anthropological doctrine. But to return to Hobbes, Pinder was one of the great mythological thinkers of antiquity. The famous image of Zeus's eagle sleeping on his scepter is one small example. His myths are among the glories of his poems. They have many uses, but the one I would 
would highlight today is how they invite us to think about the place of the gods in our world. In Greek religion, generally, the gods are in this world, all around us, even within us, not residing in some remote, transcendent realm. At least not permanently. They go to Olympus, they go elsewhere from time to time. They are everywhere. And encounters with them can be sudden and terrifying, but also exhilarating, in a word, glad. The gods are, above all, unpredictable. One typically recognizes them only after an intervention which one could not possibly have seen for coming. When it happens, something amazing, you say, aha, that is a god. Uh, in one famous formulation, in Greek religion, God is a predator. Amazing things happen, you say, that was a god. Whereas in monotheistic religions, God is a subject. You start by saying, and you learn this when you're, when you're a child, uh, God is, but God is omnipotent, God is omniscient, God is whatever. So God is a subject, and you have a long list of predators which you learn. Uh, in Greek religion, one formulation, perhaps simplistic, but really brilliant, is the other way around, God is a predator. Uh, above all, uncertain when or how, to what extent they might interfere. And Pindar replicates and dramatizes that uncertainty. He often pivots from the world of the victor to the world of myth on a single word, which creates an effect in the poem of a sudden eruption of divinity. Other times, the transition is all but imperceptible. The myth could come anywhere in the poem. It could be short, it could be long. The poem may end without actually returning from the world of myth. Within the myths, uh, direct encounter with the divine is a frequent theme. Pinder, uh, Poseidon appears to Pelops in the first Olympian, for example, and Zeus appears to Polydeuces in a passage at the end of the tenth of Mia, which by the time I would uh, dwell on it uh, certainly deserves to be called the divine. There are many scenes within the myths of encounters with divinity which invite us to, to think about how that works. Heroes, those the characters in the myth can under uh, which can they, they can withstand uh, that sort of direct encounter much more than ordinary mortals can. Uh, we would probably just be incinerated, but uh, through that we can attempt to understand and experience the sublime danger. Uncertainty about the divine is the theme also of Salvador Rosa's splendid painting. Pindar and Pan, which was for me one of the many delightful discoveries I've made in the course of researching this book. Rosa is particularly known for his mystical and awe-inspiring landscapes, which led the Romantics to enlist him as a forebearer, and also for his allegorical painting. Now, the subject here uh, derives from a story in Plutarch and elsewhere that Pan was very fond of Pindar's poetry. The uh, story is actually that Pan was seen singing one of Pindar's poems, and in gratitude, Pindar composed a, a hymn in Pan's honor. And we have some quotations from that hymn, but not enough, unfortunately, to tell us whether he ever spoke of such an encounter or whether it's a, a pleasant fiction that later um, writers invented. At any rate, uh, Rosa has. Uh, produced an extraordinary composition from this material. The scene appears to be an example of the so-called dedication of the poet, where the god, uh, usually the hall of the muses, appears and awakens the poet to their calling, or tells them that they've been writing their own kind of poetry. Now, Pan was king of the satyrs, the half-goat, half-human attendants of Dionysus, and in Rosa's day, a link was drawn between satyrs and the literary genre of satire. So one infers that satire is what Pindar is being called on to write uh, instead of whatever he is, has written already in the scroll which he holds in his hands. Uh, Rosa himself wrote biting satires, and there's a very good chance, the, the experts disagree about it, I think it probably is, um, 
a self-portrait of the painting that he had pinned up. Now, in one of his satires, he says that he regards, or implies that he regards Pinda as a satirist. And most people would find rather an odd assessment. But um, whatever the genre in question is here, I think it must be must satire. Um, the key point is the poet's response, expression on his face. He's a study of fear and astonishment and diffidence. Who, me? He appears to be saying with a gesture. Well, should he, can he be, take up the common? Is he equal to it? And to what purpose? Now, what do we make of the God's gesture? Is he beckoning upwards to heaven? So, does he encourage him to write sublime? Poetry of the sort we associate with the evolutions. Heaven uh, is the source of life in the painting, which is a metaphor for poetic uh, inspiration in Renaissance painting. Or is he simply beckoning upwards towards the human world beyond the edge of the woods? What's the nature of that smile of his? Is it really benign? The god's cloven hoof is given a certain prominence in the painting, and that is not an encouraging attribute, and the devil is in the uh, But perhaps you might think anyway that man can be trusted. But what are these guys lurking in the background here? You just barely make them up. There's one there, there's another one there. The brooding woods, the half-hidden terrors, the sudden apparition of a higher being, and the vulnerable solitude, yet at the same time, the communion with what is, after all, the God, and the possibility of artistic greatness all contribute to the sublimity of this scene. I think Rosa has caught something here of the good old pagan feeling about the divine. Romantic poets and artists who, in their dissatisfaction with Christianity, turned to ancient paganism for inspiration, continued nevertheless to think in terms of gods or God as a transcendent reality to which Greek myths provided an alternative access. Uh, as I was saying earlier, on the whole, Greek religion is one of imminence rather than transcendence, and this is a, a difference in one that we need to think about carefully. The romantic's idolization of nature made them more sensitive to Greek feelings about natural places and forces, but they tended to adopt a pantheistic position where all nature is identical with God, and they did not always distinguish one Greek God from another very carefully. And even Hildegard is guilty of this. Yet, here is another topic about which a look through the lens of reception might make us think again. Pinder does sometimes seem to think of divinity as a suffused, undifferentiated glow in and around us, a ground and context of being. If he names a god in such circumstances, Zeus is the default, standing in for all the gods. At all events, Pindar thinks deeply about the nature of divinity in general, and by implication, about the nature of humanity. The most celebrated example of this is the uh, Eighth Pythian, one of his very last poems from his old age, and the poem alongside the uh, first Pythian, which has most often been dubbed sublime by the critics. So here is its close. The flourishing of human joy is brief, and so it falls to the ground, shaken by an adverse judgment. Creatures of a day, what are we? What are we not? We are a shadow stream. But when the radiance of Zeus comes, the light shines bright around us, and our time is sweet. Dear Mother Igena, Preserve this city in the course of freedom with Zeus, mighty Iacus, Peleus, and good Telamon, and with Achilles. Now, I, I could have spent the whole lecture enthusing, indeed, about the way Pinder deploys and enriches all the resources of the Greek language here, as that is another um, indisputable element of his sublimity. There is, first of all, a profusion of metaphors gesture to what lies beyond the visible phenomenon. There is a mix of registers with high poetic diction alongside everyday words, but at the same time, these ordinary words are heightened in 
in their impact and meaning by extraordinary usage. And there is rhythmic flux. Creatures of a day, which is a single word in Greek, here it is, epaneroi, strikes like a thunderclap. Longinus would surely call this a rhyme. It's followed by a machine gun run of six monosyllables. And then the famous, we are a shadow stream. A sentence consisting of three nouns without a verb. Skias onar anthropos. A syntactical structure of which there is no other example in classical Greek. Then we have the long and stately, but when the radiance, and so on. And the parade of heroes and gods to close. A solemn catalog. There are rich ambiguities. Whose adverse judgment makes our joy fall to the ground? Ours? The gods? Or probably both together. What are we, what are we not? Is a translation resisted by some scholars, I suppose on the grounds that it's too existentialist for the mid-fifth century BCE. Uh, the alternative they prefer is, what is the somebody uh, what is someone, what is no one, in the sense, what is a somebody, what is a nobody, meaning that we have no significance unless we use of Zeus signs and forms. In fact, that was the standard translation until the late 19th century. So this shift does seem to be historically traditional, as all translation is. So uh, their point that we have no significance until Zeus, that wonderful moment that Kairos shines upon us, is perfectly true. And the Greek admits the uh, traditional translation, but it also admits the other translation. And the following shadow's dream goes beyond insignificance to insubstantiality. So I think Penny really is wondering here about the ground of our existence. So this stylistic kaleidoscope reflects the confusion of phenomena, the shimmer of the oscillation, and the quiver of strong emotion. Aegina was facing a mortal threat to its existence when the poem was written, a threat realized only 15 years later when the Athenians forcibly expelled the entire population. Pindar wrote more poems for Aegina than any other city and clearly had the deepest affection for the place, for his heroes who were related in Greek mythology to the heroes of his own Thebes and to his people. Dear Mother Aegina, Another thunderclap moment, a pindaric juxtaposition of abstract reflection with brutally concrete reality. And this is indeed one of the greatest passages in ancient Greek literature, and I hope that I've been able to make you feel some of the admiration that, that I have for this poem and for the end of the uh, first epithemia. Uh, sorry, for the beginning of the first epithemia. For the first epithemia, full stop. Um, now, I'll just close by quoting um, or responding to a, a curious remark of <coughs> uh, Jim Porter of Berkeley, who wrote a wonderful book uh, on the sublime <coughs> antiquity, published not long ago, and he's a, a great friend of ours here in Bristol. But at the end of it, a very long book, on page 622, he reminds us that his purpose has been to understand what historical conditions have shaped our aesthetic judgments, not to revive the sublime as a category in modern criticism. And he quotes Richard Jebb, the eminent Greek scholar who was a professor in Cambridge, who in 1882 had said that certain lines of Pinder were sublime. And Porter comments, perhaps few scholars today could any longer issue a judgment like this without blushing. Well, I do want to say that Pinder is divine, and I do not feel the color rising in my cheeks. <laughs>